Fahim Sarani is a technical lead at Maxis Advanced Analytics Center of Excellence. His role, function around, his role functions around creating and delivering unique solutions in the space of machine learning for the telco. He also serves as a technical advisor for a health and wellness analytics startup. Previously, he also worked as a software developer for consumer-facing products in Asia and North America. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to our speaker, Fahim Surani. Good morning, Yali Millet, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Asmina. Right at the onset, I want to thank both the IPN team and the education portfolio. They've been um, great to work with, specifically Alim, Azim, Azmina, Shamin, and Amina. Um, whether it was accommodating my schedule or helping with slides or giving me constructive criticism, you guys have been really awesome and I'm flattered to be considered. And it's an honor to be here in front of the Jamaat to share um, a little bit of, about artificial intelligence. So thanks. Um, let's get into it immediately. So let's talk about today's agenda. We're going to cover a few things. The first thing is we're going to explain all these buzzwords this is sort of the meat and potatoes of it. We're going to talk about AI. We're going to explain ML. We're going to see how it relates to big data. We're also going to talk a little bit about um, why is it popular all of a sudden now instead of earlier in the 20 or 30 years. We're going to talk about how it's being used today. There's a lot of examples out there, but these are going to be personal to me, things that I have somewhat experience in. We're going to talk about career paths and what to expect day to day. So practical advice on how to get into it. We're going to talk a little bit about the dark side and the ethics. I think that's important since this is an IPN thing to talk a little bit about ethics. And if there's time, we're going to talk about the Q, uh, we're going to have a bit of a Q&A. So let's get into this. So the first thing we're going to talk about is artificial intelligence. When most people think about artificial intelligence, we think about these guys. We think about Jarvis, we think about Transformers, we think about E from Ex Machina, we think about the Terminator. Now these guys are really advanced, they're really special, they're kind of a work of fiction. And within the research community, we have a very specific term for these things. These things are called artificial general intelligence. Now in order to classify something as artificial general intelligence, you need to satisfy these criteria. And these are directly from Wikipedia. There's other things like the Turing test and the coffee test, if you're familiar with it. But in essence, in order to be considered artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence, you need to be able to reason on your own. It needs to be able to find solutions to unique, never before seen problems, um, can interact with people in a natural way. So that means you don't have to speak in a specific way in order for it to understand you or interact with it and, able, and should be able to plan and learn. Now we don't see this out really, but what do we really see out there in the market that's posing as artificial intelligence? We see these things. We see spam filters, we see chat bots, we see voice recognition, we see recommendation engines. And these things aren't actually intelligent. In fact, some of these things, or most of these things are very, very dumb. For example, a recommendation engine will never be able to do stock market predictions. Siri, although great at voice recognition, is not gonna be great at playing chess, and so on and so forth. In the research field, these have a specific term, and these are considered narrow AI because they're built to solve a very specific set of problems. Now, most people haven't heard the term narrow AI. These things are also classified as another buzzword, and that's machine learning. Now, machine learning is very old. In fact, here's a quote I found from 1959. And machine learning is simply the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Now, Believe it or not, most of you have probably been using machine learning every single day for decades. And the great example of this that I could come up with in Excel is this. This is a line of best fit. You guys probably use it for projection graphs and all these sorts of things. This is something that people have been using for a very long time. But this is a really good and pretty nuanced example of how machine learning works. So first of all, you have all these little set of data points and your machine learning algorithm or your machine learning model is that line of best fit. Now you'll notice that the line doesn't hit all of the points, so it's never 100% accurate. You'll notice that it's kind of generalizing in between everything. And when you guys use it in Excel, you kind of just click a button and it just shows up and you're not explicitly programming how to do this. And that's also kind of how machine learning, at least I would imagine, will become uh, very in the near future because it's just click of a button. 
Now, when you sometimes hear, okay, there's this new machine learning model, there's a lot more math involved, it's a lot more complicated all of a sudden. Another example to sort of, you know, extend this would be something like this. So you have the same points. And when you look at each individual good, gooder and goodest, you'll see that the math gets more complicated. The first one's got two humps, so that's X squared. The gooder's got three humps and it's X cubed and so on and so forth. So whenever you hear in the media that there's a new algorithm, it's using more math, it's kind of like this. You can see the first one, we're a little bit closer to some points and we're a little bit further away from others. So the algorithm has improved. And in some cases, you know, it may or may not be the best thing. So let's, for example, let's assume the goodest is the brand new smartest algorithm. It's giving us a lot of accuracy or close to all these points. But if you imagine that your next point in your projection was somewhere here, well, probably this one or this one, the older method is a lot better than the newer one, right? Because this would probably predict somewhere down here. So that's the, that's the other thing with machine learning, just because it's new, just because it's, you know, smart and using a lot of complicated math doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Now, of course, the devil's in the details, and machine learning actually looks a lot like this. There's three big main pillars of machine learning. So let's go through each one very quickly. The first one is supervised learning. It's on the right here. Now, supervised learning is exactly what it sounds like. It's kind of like when you're teaching a, car, a kid with flashcards. So the way you're going to be doing it is you're going to show it a flashcard with a picture of a dog and a picture of a cat, and you're going to say, hey, what is this? Oh, this is a dog. And hey, what is this? This is a cat. So what you need is a labeled data set. So the way this works is, or ways that people are using it, immediately image classification appear makes perfect sense because that's exactly what we're doing with flashcards. This is the dog, this is the cat, this is a person. You can use it for fraud detection and diagnostics and healthcare. You say, hey, this is an example of what cancer looks like and this is what a healthy cell looks like or a healthy x-ray looks like and so on and so forth. The other big sort of, um, pillar of machine learning is unsupervised learning. And now unsupervised learning is a little bit more complicated. It's kind of clustering or grouping things together. So if you have a lot of blocks of a bunch of different sizes that are square and you have a lot of spheres, you don't actually tell the machine learning algorithm or the, or the person that, hey, this is what a block is and this is what a square is. You kind of tell them, hey, group them together. And we'll talk a little bit more about this and I'll see you know, clarify this a bit more, but it really is used for segmentation. So you can imagine that you have a whole bunch of different customers. They have a whole bunch of different behavior. You don't really have the label for them. I don't know what kind of person this is, but they kind of behave similarly. So please, uh, using math, ask the, you ask the machine learning engine to try to figure out, hey, can you group them together and make sense of this? And the last one, and probably the most complicated and the most interesting of, of all is reinforcement learning. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that involves essentially creating a very accurate simulation of that environment that you're in, whether it's a game AI or, you know, robot navigation, which is virtual reality, and then letting your machine learning algorithm learn as it goes. And I will elaborate a little bit more on this. So on the right, let's look at a supervised learning algorithm. So just like I said before, you know that in blue that you have these dots and that's, you know, for sure, this is one type of class. Then you have these other dots and you know for sure these are these types of dots and you draw a line between them and that's your machine learning algorithm that's saying it's supervised. It's saying okay now you know that what the blue dots look like, what the green dots look like and or I guess that's red um, or orange and then you, you decide uh, and you learn. And so the next time it sees these gray dots that you've never known it automatically is able to figure it out. Unsupervised learning just like I said before it's clustering. You don't really know how the dots, what they mean, what they are, where they belong. You just say, can you just draw circles around them? So the next time a dot does show up, you kind of know where it belongs. So this is what reinforcement learning is. So at the top, this is a reinform, uh, reinforcement learning algorithm by Google. What they did was they created a virtual environment with blocks and obstacles in the way. And they said, Okay, so this is how legs are allowed to work. This is how a torso is allowed to work. I just want you to go from A to B. That's it. There was no other rules set up to it. And it rewarded it in a way uh, every time it made it. And it, whenever it failed, it failed. And that algorithm didn't get through. And so over time, it learned that this is the best way to run. And that's pretty interesting. I think if you can go and uh, Google this up, uh, you'll find a lot of funny and other ways to run that were pretty cool too. But this is a lot like how children learn, right? You don't always 
uh, take a child and when they're just born, you start putting your feet, you know, near them and teaching them, hey, this is how you walk necessarily. They start to crawl. They learn that that's a little bit less inefficient based on their limbs. They start to stand up. They start to walk on their own. And yeah, that's exactly like a reinforcement learning algorithm. The difference is it's only as good as your simulation. And of course, we haven't gotten there yet. So let's step back. I think that was about as detailed as I want to go. The other big elephant in the room when a lot of people talk about AI and machine learning is big data. Now, this Venn diagram sort of illustrates that they're two very separate things. Artificial intelligence, which doesn't exist, narrow AI and machine learning is within. You'll hear phrases like neural nets and deep learning, but they're just a very specific and only one type of machine learning. There's a lot more out there, like we talked about, and they don't all use deep learning or neural nets. And big data is separate, but you do need data. Now, another way to look at this is something like this. So same graph, exact same thing, AI and machine learning on the left and big data on the right. And that's, this is how you can view it. So big data would be like an oil refinery and everything that surrounds this. So refining the oil, extracting it from the ground, figuring out where to mine it, how to clean it, how to get it from point A to point B, the logistics involved, the manpower involved, the infrastructure, that's all big data. And machine learning and AI would be considered, well, like your cars and your planes. Because these things, yes, they do use a very specific type of fuel. And sometimes they need a lot more fuel and sometimes they need a lot less. Doesn't make one better than the other. It just depends on the task at hand. And of course, you have your DeLorean, your time machine, which needs a different kind of fuel. And it's just the stuff of fantasy for now. So now that you've got a little bit of an idea of some of these buzzwords, the next question you should probably be asking yourself is, okay, since it's so old and we've been doing it since 1959, why is there an explosion now? Now, there are three reasons I'm going to go over to and briefly talk about the third. The first reason is what happens in the internet in a minute. So we're looking at in a minute, there's 4.1 million YouTube views. There's 452,000 tweets, a lot of swipes on Tinder, things like this. And so we're generating a lot of data. But it's not only the fact that we're generating a lot of data. A lot of this data is very public and it's very well labeled. For example, tweets and Twitter and Instagram posts are public. So if today I was making a face recognition algorithm, I would have access to everyone's pictures and it's very labeled. It says, this is this person, this is this person. If I wanted to have images of locations, it's all there. If I wanted to do it even in the year 2000, where would I get that kind of data? I just wouldn't be able to have enough data to do anything meaningful with it. So that's one reason. The other reason is, of course, computing. And this is a graph that shows the cost per dollar for uh, graphics cards, GPUs. As it turns out, gaming has been fueling a lot of the deep learning and the AI and the ML kind of uh, revolution. Because if you look at this graph in the last 10 years, for the same amount of money, you're getting 16 times more performance. And that's kind of amazing. And that's the other reason where if you have a lot more publicly accessible data for everyone, and gaming has gotten so popular that everyone probably does gaming at some point now, and they already have this incredibly powerful overpowered graphics card, it's very easy to start doing it. And the third reason, which I don't have a slide for that I just want to briefly touch on, is the fact that even in the 70s and the 60s, we created these algorithms that, um, that were before its time. They were thinking about if we had a lot of computing power and if we had a lot of um, data, we could make these complicated, fancy machine learning um, results. But, you know, we don't have that now, but we're, gonna, we're just going to write it down and we're going to put it away. So all the research is not from scratch either. So it's taking things that people have built on, they've already created, putting it in front of all this processing power, and it's gotten better and better over the past 10 years. Okay, so that should be a good brief overview of sort of the buzzwords surrounding it. I, I know that was pretty quick, um, but I didn't want to get too detailed. So let's talk about how it's being used today. Okay, and these examples, there's a million way, uh, examples out there, but we're going to talk about the ones that I really like. The first one is healthcare. And uh, one of the ones that came out, I think, in 2018 or 2019, if I remember, is Google Health tried something. Um, they were taking images of eyeballs, and they were able to predict diabetic retinopathy within 10 minutes. And this is pretty cool because this is a lot of how 
the AI and machine learning space has evolved over the past, you know, 10 or 20 years within healthcare. And the reason why it says two are better than one, because most of the healthcare um, results are way better when you combine a physician with an ML alone. They're not as great. I mean, physicians are always great, but when you combine them, they're even better. Now, the interesting thing here is, I mean, I don't want to hype this up too much. What they did was they tried this in Thailand. And then when they launched it in India, they found it was terrible because the reality of the situation with these things is that you're not going to get a perfectly, you know, great image of an eyeball. People are going to be fidgety. It's the resolution won't be exact. So, and, and it completely failed. I mean, it says here, um, the code is in principle, gave a result in 10 minutes. It took two hours to do 10 uh, scans in, in reality when they when they launch it in India. So I think the other thing I want to elucidate with all these examples is sometimes we hear these things in the news and they're not as great. So another fun one that I liked, and this is in retail, there's a concept called know your customer or KYC if you're in the industry, you'll start hearing this buzzword. And what Target ended up doing, um, I think this was almost a decade and a half ago, is they said, you know, what if we used an unsupervised learning algorithm and clustered a whole bunch of people together? And one of the clusters they ended up finding were people who bought diapers and were pregnant. So what Target, what the business guy said is like, you know what, what we should do is if we know that someone is going to be pregnant because they started buying diapers, let's see the kind of things that they used to or the things that they look at or the things that they're gonna buy before they're even pregnant, right? Before they've delivered the child. And what we'll do is when we figure this out, we'll send them a flyer and we'll give them discounts so that when they're pregnant, they have Target in their brain and they go buy the discounts and the diapers there. So what ended up happening is uh, Target sent a flyer to this house in the Midwest of the US. The father got it and he called in. He's like, you know what? There's no one in my house that's pregnant. I have one daughter and I have a wife and she's, neither of them are pregnant because I would definitely know. And as it turns out, you can probably imagine that the daughter was pregnant. They hadn't told the husband or the, yeah, they haven't, they hadn't told the father. And then he, he wrote an apologetic email and said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know they were keeping it from me and they wanted to tell me at the right time. So yes, uh, I mean, there's a great ways that you can use uh, ML to predict things well before they happen, including pregnancies. Now, the other big elephant in, you know, I, you really have to talk about Amazon when you talk about recommendation engines is, yeah, the recommendation engine that is able to recommend things that people have bought or, you know, purchase with purchase. And in 2013, I thought this was pretty interesting. It's a hard number that 35% of their revenue was generated by their recommendation engine. And you can imagine how evolved it is now. And even a naive implementation of this is actually getting results. So I thought that was pretty telling. Now, Vision is really popular. You've seen deep fakes, you've seen face recognition, you've seen a whole bunch of things out there in the market. And these things have existed for a long time. But Netflix takes it a step further. And I thought this was a creative use. This is all for the same show. The show is Netflix's Stranger Things. And what Netflix decided to do is, you know what, it's not just the show that matters. It's the image that we show them from the show that will get them to watch the video or not. So depending on the type of customer you are that they've segmented you in, they may show you a different image. If you're into horror, they're going to show you this big scary one. Maybe you're, you know, like me and you're into nerd culture and nostalgia. They're going to show you an image from the show that's got the Ghostbusters in there. And they're using their image recognition technology to recognize uh, what's in the image, what kind of pictures do people like, and then put it all together. And I thought this was novel because this is something that existed for a really long time, the capability, but no one had done it. So you can just be creative. Now, there, I know this is a wall of text and you can read this on your own time, but I thought this was interesting. The way that Apple approaches AI, and you don't really think of Apple as an AI company, is that they put it in all of the hidden places. So, for example, you wouldn't think about it, but when you're using machine learning, when you're using an Apple iPad and you're putting your hand with the Apple Pen and you're writing, that rejection, that palm rejection to know that, you know, I shouldn't make a mark where the palm is, is definitely machine learning. And the takeaway here, and there's a few other examples here, but the takeaway here is that the last line. So it's almost like find me something where we're not using machine learning. And for Apple, it's become less of a buzzword and a pillar and a marketing scheme and more of this is ingrained in our day-to-day -day activity, much like in Excel where you don't really think anymore about your line of best fit or your projection mapping as kind of ML. So this is kind of cool. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have seen Deepfake. 
And uh, deep fake is pretty cool. It's also really scary and we can talk about that a bit. But this is taking it a step further. This is from a university in the US. This is research uh, that they were doing and they put out. What they did was take a lot of videos of you know, Obama, President Obama and um, his speeches. And then what they did was they used just his voice, no more imagery. And they said, if I had a voice clip of Obama, could you generate the result? And that's the result you're seeing. You're not seeing a deep fake. You're seeing just someone using speech alone, no video, and being able to get accurate lip manipulation, head movement, eyes. It's completely generated from scratch. And this is really cool. Uh, you can imagine that, you know, um, if you were a lip reader and they tested on lip readers and they were saying, yes, they can, they can understand what's going on here. But um, yeah, you, you can imagine how diff- where the industry can go from here. So it's definitely an ethical problem, but I thought it was cool. And again, just to bring everyone back down to reality for this one, they probably had 100,000 hours of video and probably had good 10, 15 minutes where it looked this realistic. So it's still definitely in the works and don't be afraid quite yet. Now, this is really cool. I hope this gets the load. Um, This is from Google I.O. in um, 2019, and this is... Google has voice assistant, they have Siri, we've all heard this before. And what Google ended up doing was, they said, you know what, why don't we get our voice assistant to call businesses, pose as the AI and make appointments for you? And kind of like an actual assistant. So this is a one minute clip, I do wanna show this because I thought this was really, really cool. Um, I don't like using videos, but let's give this a shot. Hopefully this loads on my end. Okay. So just to be clear, that voice you're hearing right now, this is a, that's a virtual assistant. That's something that Google uh, came up with on their own. So just listen to how great it is. Okay. Okay. I guess, I guess we can't hear the video voice, but um, I'll really quickly go through it. What in effect happens is that the assistant does the call. It, you know, handles sort of all the queries that the actual person has and is able to make an appointment between a particular, you know, uh, time frame. Now this is really, really cool because this is actually a product that's launched in the U S it's called Google duplex. People can play around with it and it got so good. It was so accurate that, um, the U S had to pass a law that said, when you start a conversation, when Google assistant starts a conversation with a real person, it has to say, Hey, by the way, I'm a virtual assistant and because people couldn't tell. So it's really, really cool. And uh, I urge everyone to just take a look at it. It's called Google duplex. Okay. Now the last one I want to touch on is something called GP3. Um, I know this is wordy. GP3T3 is a natural language processing machine learning algorithm, which basically means it's great at understanding text and extracting information from text. And there, this is brand new. It just came out. It's been hitting the news constantly. Um, it's open source, which is great, which means that anyone can download it and play with it. It's no longer under the purview of these large org companies like Google and Amazon. And it does a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to go through some of them. Uh, first one we can talk about if anyone's in software programming, what they did was they gave GPT-3 a bit of React code and trained it a little bit, which is a specific programming language um, in a couple of components. And they said, you know what? Why don't you uh, make me a button? that's red and it does this and automatically it generated the programming code in the back end and it was good and that's it. So imagine in the future, maybe if this gets, you know, uh, taken up, you don't have to program anymore. Another cool thing that it did was this was really amazing. Um, these are links you guys can look at, but they used GP3 T3 and they gave it a question from a medical textbook. It was a multiple choice one. It understood what the question was asking. It understood and had enough knowledge about the background of the medical question and was able to give the right answer. 
And this is amazing because this is a general purpose algorithm, which means it wasn't trained. It wasn't specifically narrow in one field of expertise. It was trained on all of the internet and as much data as they could. So this is why it was really nice and exciting. <laughs> it tries to get a software job. It comes close to passing the phone screen in interview. There's more and more and more. I think the, the really cool one was turning natural language into lawyer ease. So you give it a normal text and it was able to turn it into legal text. And, you know, you can already see where this could become, pro you know, problematic. You can teach it how someone speaks or someone writes and it will, you know, rewrite it in, in their sort of frame in their vernacular. And this is something that people have tried. I think uh, you can already see where this is going. There may be specific things that we have uh, text that people could train it on and, and get very similar examples. So yes, it's very cool. Definitely take it out. Please click on the links and get your prepared to be have uh, your mind blown. So, okay, so we have a few examples of how it's being used today. Um, let's talk a little bit more about career paths and see what it's going to be like if you decide to get into AI. Now, the first slide here, this is the path for an ML engineer. This is just to illustrate the fact that how complicated and how winding your road can be. There's no right answer. You can start from anywhere and end up anywhere. Um, and that's, and that's just for a machine learning engineer. So the field is massive. It's huge. It's not tiny. You have plenty of time and you can get into whatever niche you want within it. So that's kind of what this slide is uh, attempting to illustrate, but let's get into it. So the, the way I've done this is on the left in this light bluish, you'll have, if you're in it and on the right, um, this is if you're more of a business marketing, you know, uh, less, um, it person. So if you're an executive in the mid-level and you're just starting off your career and you want to start getting into AI and ML, the first thing I would say is start from your strengths. So if you're a back-end engineer or if you're a front-end engineer, um, if you're back-end, learn some cloud APIs. Now, what that basically means is that companies like Google and Amazon have turned a lot of their AI components. For example, their recommendation engine, Amazon's, the one that gave them 35% extra revenue, they've turned it into an API. So you don't have to program it yourself. You can use it and start building your own recommendation engines. So learning how they work and the intricacies between that, it's great. Front ends, you can play with front end APIs, the, the visual components of it, which are really great as well. But regardless of who you are uh, in your IT, just start learning the ML engineering side of things. That's a great entry point and it will open up everything for you. This is the type of people that should probably learn executive mid-level or the individuals that should learn um, object-oriented programming and Python. So a lot of people ask me, should I learn Python only if you're executive to mid-level? That would be my recommendation. And these are some of the um, comments that you should learn. These are things that you can start Googling and these are frameworks. If you're, if you're on the management side of things, if you're on the business development side of things, definitely learn a lot more about data visualization. Learn some of these tools, Power BI, Tableau, Google Analytics, ClickView. These are kind of the hot uh, new tools that you'll probably need. Learn a little bit about basic statistics and probabilities. We'll talk a little bit about why that's important and start to get a feeling of under, uh, understanding data science. Because realistically, when you first start off um, at your first job in this, you'll be asked to, to do these kind of things. You'll be doing a lot of data exploration, data visualization, data cleansing. Now that's because your machine learning algorithm is only going to be as good as your data. If anyone has ever looked at data from an online form, you know it's absolutely terrible. Um, it's always misspelled, it's capitalizations, and computers don't understand that. So it needs to be clean, it needs to be made uniform. Um, the other things you're gonna be doing is building your domain expertise in your individual field. You're gonna learn how to do a lot more documentation for um, algorithms that are rule-based, that's what heuristic means, and as well as the machine learning thing. So you're gonna have to do a lot of documentation. You're gonna do a lot of dashboarding because your middle and senior level managers are gonna to wanna to see the outputs and the graphs and you know, really be able to understand what they mean. And very rarely are you gonna be doing new uh, methodologies and doing all the fun machine learning algorithms. And, and I think that's a bit of a misconception that people have is that uh, they think that they'll immediately start doing the really cool sexy things, but at the beginning, you're not gonna be doing any of that. Now, what if you're middle to senior? And I think I, I'm imagining most of you are here. So again, on the left side, branch from your strengths if you're in IT. If you're a solution architect, concentrate on those pre-built APIs. 
if you're a database guy, start looking at some of the big data stuff. The things you want to start Googling are ETL, which is extract, transform, and load, and automation. Um, the other thing you want to start doing is if you're a software dev, is, um, you know, if you're a hardware, there's a big, big thing going on with uh, machine learning on device on the edge. Start looking at that. That's probably where you guys can really flourish. And of course, security, we need that GPDR, we need that privacy, we need governments, governance. If you're a DevOps guy, which is very few of you, I imagine right now, look at MLOps. Now, if you're on the business side of things, it's going to get a little bit more complicated. Same uh, advice as before, but learn a lot more about case studies and really lean into sort of understanding data science and statistics. And let me give you an example of exactly why and some of the problems you'll probably face on a day-to-day -day basis. So imagine that you have a junior data scientist or a guy that you've developed and you said, hey, go through this database. I want you to clean, clean all this and I want you to put these graphs together and show me a graph. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And that's, that, that's the other thing. Everyone should understand machine learning, data science, um, life cycles. You know, you need to understand your bias and your data consistency. You need to understand all these methods. Yeah, everyone. And, and let's talk about exactly why. So you're going to need to create these um, you're going to have to start and create data lakes. You're going to start creating research um, articles. On, you're going to have to publish. That's a lot of what a lot of companies are doing. You're going to start talking about data de uh, democratization because everyone needs access to the data. That's what's going to happen if you're in IT. You're going to have to understand correlation versus causation. And middle management and seniors, you're going to have to do a lot of data storytelling. It's very complicated um, most of the time to understand all of this. You can imagine that if you go to your CEO and you're going to show him, you know, 15, 20 graphs, what he's going to tell you is, so what? Or she's going to tell you, okay, wrap it up. And you're going to have to be good at that. And doing a lot of investigation to see whether th what your junior level guys have done actually makes sense. So here's an example. This is what I've been trying to get at. Um, so this is a graph. One is a number of people who've drowned by falling into a pool. And the other one is uh, films that Nicolas Cage has appeared in. Now, if you notice, the graphs are very similar. They're highly correlated. They're right next to each other. So if, if you were in a company and your job is to reduce the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool, if you look at just this data, you would say the best way is Nicolas Cage should stop appearing in films. Now, of course, this isn't true. That's not how it works. But this is one of the problems that that happens in data on a day-to-day -day basis is you'll get graphs, you'll get data, it correlates, it works, but does it really make sense to do it this way? So let's give a more specific example. Here's another graph that's very, very, very similar. And it shows on the left side that as the sales of organic food sales increase, so does autism. And look, the graphs are right next to each other, right? So you can tell me intuitively that this is incorrect, but using the same logic and the same foundation, why is this correct or incorrect? And so this is the problems that you'll face in middle management on a day-to-day -day basis. Don't bother trying to learn Python or sort of the delivery side of things. Understand why this is wrong or right and does it make sense? The other thing is on the right side where we have our distribution of training versus test. So what this means is imagine today, in the COVID scenario, you started gathering all of your data and you made a new machine learning algorithm and you test and you tested it and it was like, wow, we got a hundred percent accuracy or really great accuracy, right? This is your training data is all, you know, coming from this particular area. Then you launch it. COVID eventually gets over and people start going back to their normal pattern. Now your ML algorithm is completely wonky. It no longer works properly. That happens often in reality that during the period that you're creating your ml algorithm or if you didn't take into account a large amount of data or from a large enough time period you may not able to capture all of the cyclical nature of your users or your situation so that's the other thing you need to make sure as a middle manager that when someone is presenting you data and they're giving you all of this information did they use the right data set does it make sense to use it did they leave things out so these are the kind of questions that you should be asking and should be learning to strive to be able to answer. So if you're senior level, uh, not much here that I can give you advice. You guys should be very comfortable with dealing with the unknown. 
I will summarize and say you should be able to understand cost, really time to market, and just read a lot more case studies. You guys get to sort of be creative and set the direction of where you should invest your time and money. Okay, so hopefully that was very useful for everyone. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions down the line, but let's move on and start talking about the dark side of this and some of the ethics surrounding it. So the first thing I wanna talk about is this image. It's an image of a whole bunch of people, cute baby, different races, but all of these uh, images are fake. They don't actually exist. Um, this is something that an AI created. It dreamed is what people like to say. It's from something specific called a GAN network. And you can already imagine that if I'm able to create images, these are people that don't exist. Imagine how great fake IDs, or if I wanna mess with someone, how easy that would be. I mean, you guys did uh, a CV clinic on LinkedIn, and I don't know if they talked about it, but if you're in recruitment, one of my friends told me that they noticed that female recruiters get more uh, results than male recruiters if they have a nice picture. So, you know, if I wanted to, to do recruitment, I would go here, I would get a picture of a fake uh, a woman and put it as, a, as my profile, and I would start generating more leads. So again, is that ethical? I don't know, but that's where this is going. The other thing I want to talk about is the rise of bots and disinformation. So here's an example of something from Twitter. All of these are fake accounts. And obviously, you know this because they're tweeting the same thing. So someone used GPT-2, the old version, and they made a bot and they used it to understand when someone was talking about um, the Black Lives Movement. And because they were against it, anytime someone was talking positively about it, because GPT-2 can understand your sentiment and what you're talking about, they would tweet this. And this is interesting because it's kind of creepy. If you notice, if you know a little bit about Twitter, some of these things are getting a lot of retweets. They're getting a lot of hearts. Now, if I wanted to do a poll on Twitter, if I wanted to just get a general idea and say, are people talking positively about BLM or negatively? With the advent of bots and automation, it's going to skew my data. It's going to ruin my own data set. And I'll immediately start thinking it's negative. So if, as someone who doesn't know anything about BLM and doesn't have the time to look into it, what I'll assume is, well, if everyone says it's bad, it's probably safe to assume that it's bad. But is it everyone or are these bots? So this is, again, information warfare is becoming a problem. The other uh, thing jumping off this is echo chambers. Now, this is a research, uh, an image from a research uh, article that came out. And this is, these are tweets. And these are tweets of people who are left-leaning and right-leaning, so blue and red, and how often they spoke with other people within their group. And as you can see, everyone who was left-leaning only spoke with people who were left because their recommendation algorithm only presented them with things that they like which is the goal of a recommendation algorithm. So if they only like things that are left-leaning, they create an echo chamber and they never learn critical thinking. They never see the opposing viewpoint. They're never able to understand, you know, the, the, the milieu and the intricacies of something as complicated as political um, sides. So this is actually a really big problem and it'll also exist globally. So very quickly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about things that I have been asked, well, myself and other people within the industry. These are some of my friends. And these are things that we've been asked to build. And I think some of these are questionable. I won't go through all of them. Uh, but you can see that predictive employees are going to quit their job. Imagine that's great for my HR to know. But if I'm able to do that and I'm able to build that and I, my algorithm is imperfect and it's wrong, they may not get a bonus next year because the algorithm says, hey, they're going to quit anyway. So is that ethical? Maybe not. And how would I even go about doing this? You know, um, looking at SMS and CDR data. So SMS and call data record, usually most companies will say it's too massive, it's too expensive, we don't get enough of an ROI out of it, which is why your privacy is kept. But if all of a sudden me as an advanced analytics lead can find some useful way to get information from SMS, now a company may have more reasons to read your SMSs in the first place and a lot of other things. And of course, these are the answers you'll get from your middle management and upper management about why we should do these things. If we don't do it, someone else will. So I guess it's okay to do it. They'll talk about, you know, we're still learning about access control. Now imagine if, you know, your manager is nefarious. He's got access to third party uh, location data. 
he can start spying on whoever he wants and getting an edge competitively. But it's okay because, you know, access control is something we're learning. We'll worry about it later. You should be a team player. These are all things that myself or other people within my field have heard as answers when you've brought it up as problems. So there are ethical concerns away from sort of the big picture issues. From a day-to-day -day when you're in the field, you're going to start having problems like these. And this is very difficult to sort of address because you never know what to do. And as someone who, you know, we are at the end of the day, we're smileys and ethics is really important to us. This is somewhere where you're going to have to start making a consideration on what is it that you're going to do in these situations and are you okay with it? So I think, uh, I think that's it for me. I'm hoping that this sparks a little bit of a discussion and I want to go ahead and hand it over to um, Azim for the questions and answers. Thank you very, very much. That certainly answers a lot of questions that I had um, around the way Amazon and other companies get my information. Um, we actually have quite, quite a few questions, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, the, the first one, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this, but the, the question is, how often have you seen businesses, particularly startups, using these buzzwords as purely marketing and pitching strategies while the business is not itself primarily focusing on these technologies? Okay, um, pretty often, pretty often. And I think that's kind of how I imagine the future of ML becoming. It's very quickly becoming something that you don't really think about. I think there is a marketing buzz right now around it because there's a lot of hype surrounding it. And most startups will put in AI um, and it doesn't really mean AI. Uh, my own company, the one that I worked at, Maxis, is guilty of this. You see in Malaysia, you see AI 5G network, and it's A dot I dot, and it doesn't actually mean artificial intelligence. It's like advanced something. And so, yes, it is, it's pretty common. It's very often, and it's pretty consistent. But I guess that's just the marketing game right now. How So um, AI is completely, or is it completely dependent on historical information, which then predicts future behavior. So is it only, if, if you're using AI for something new, say, so I'm in banking, and mm -hmm. if I were to use AI to detect fraud um, on, you know, uh, on our entire portfolio of say 2000 customers, uh, would we have to feed the machine fast information on these 2000 customers for it to then predict future behavior. That is one type. So what you're talking about is remember there was three types. We had the reinforcement, we had the supervised and we had the unsupervised. So supervised would be an example of that. It's predictive. So you do show it past behavior and it's able to predict future behavior up to a certain extent. And that's one of those things that will probably constantly have to be trained over and over and over again. That's sort of when you're in senior, or when you're in middle management, you have to understand it will constantly need that data because markets changed. And depending on how much data you can give it, that's how accurate it will be. So in that specific example, yes, it will, it's highly dependent on your historical data. And the more historical data you have, the better it is in most cases. Thank you. Uh, what sorts of jobs do you think AI will remove from existence and transform into something new uh, or uh, create brand new jobs that don't even exist today? Well, there's a lot. Uh, one example that I've seen coming up nowadays is the idea of selling data. So like I talked about that when you're an entry level data scientist or in the field, you have to do a lot of cleaning and a lot of manipulation of the data and making sure it's ready to be used because it's very garbage in and garbage out. So there's a lot of companies that have propped up that are specializing in a data cleaning and data manipulation so that you're ready to go as quickly as possible. Um, the other things 
I see it more of enabling. So robotics will become a lot more popular because now image is getting better. Understanding your environment is getting a lot better. Self-driving cars have made understanding the environment that you're in a lot better as well. So you can imagine having a little virtual assistant robot that will follow you around for medical um, issues or anything like that becoming a lot more prominent. But to be honest, when you see all the articles and research from companies like McKinsey and PwC, or you speak to different cloud providers, no one really knows right now. And a lot of this technology is out there and it's been out there for a while. And it's just all about the creative uses. Of it. Just like the Netflix example, that image classification thing has been out forever. And only Netflix sort of kicked in on say, hey, what if we change the thumbnail of the video? And it had a huge impact. So you don't know, uh, no one really knows. You hear conflicting depending on their motivations and biases. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, which cloud provider, AWS, Azure, Google, is currently leading the race with machine learning tools and has the edge over the other? Ooh, uh, this is a little bit, okay. So this is the, exactly my field. This is what I work on on a day-to-day -day basis. I would say it really depends, and that's a terrible answer, but that's the case. Um, Okay, so Amazon is great mainly because they just do everything. So they've been in the cloud provider market forever. So if you want to build your own recommendation engine, you want your own speech to text, you want it to sound like the Google Assistant, they have a million tools for everything, along with all the other tools that you need for your regular IT day to day. Google is kind of leading the forefront on sort of the ML space in general. So I think if we're only looking at AI and ML, it would have to be Google, but Amazon is good enough for most industries and they just do a lot more. Azure is going a slightly different direction. So whereas Google is a little bit more for nerds um, and you kind of have to know your, you have to build an expertise and Amazon is going a little bit more towards the middle of the road in terms of how complicated their APIs and their UI is, you know, how easy it is to get into. Azure is going the full, like, I don't want you to code anything. I want you to just point and click. They're behind in terms of options, but they're trying to build the most accessible one. So I think that's where they sit. So it's, it's, so to answer this question specifically for ML tools, maybe Google, um, but ease of use, Azure and comprehensive Amazon. Great, thank you. So um, a number of questions from our Jamaat who are over the age of 50, myself included. Um, should any of us be worried about our, our jobs? Um, and, I, and I guess this is a pretty broad question, you know, depending on what uh, industries we're in, but uh, a couple of people have asked this question actually. Um, and I guess, you know, for those of us that are in mid or senior management in our fifties, you know, what advice could you possibly give to ensure that we are AI savvy? Okay. I think, um, if you're in middle management, I don't think you need to worry yet or at all, probably not even in the future. Um, I'm in my experience from what I've seen in the various industries that I've worked with and different companies. I would say most likely it'll just become another tool. It'll be like apps, for example, right? It's not something that you really think about that often. It'll just be another way for you to consume graphs. So what I would say is you don't need to worry about your job, but I would become educated and sort of, like I said, the data science stuff and understanding when it's correlation, when it's causation, learning to ask the right questions. Um, that's kind of the advice I would give for the people that should be worried about their jobs. I would say maybe obviously very entry level people that's going to be very difficult. And you can see already with COVID situation, if you were a cashier or something like that, maybe you're going to have a little bit less work now because it's all contactless. Um, the other individuals that should be a little bit worried is that programming will not be as big of a deal potentially um, because maybe some of the nuance will be gone. Um, I, I see more of it as AI becoming a superpower. I wouldn't say worry about your jobs yet. And I think there's a lot of people scaring people out there right now that's saying, oh no, you have to learn programming, you have to learn coding, AI is gonna take over your job. I don't think that's the case. It'll just become a superpower. You'll stop having to do routine banal tasks 
and get to move on to do things that use your brain a bit more. So I wouldn't be worried. I, I think you may have answered uh, from this question uh, on the next question, but I'll, I'll, I'll pose it anyway. Um, on an ethical big picture note, with AI seeping into every industry and employees being replaced rapidly, how do you see the future for young individuals as employment opportunities diminish and what industries are less sensitive to this? Hmm. Um, I think more and more what will happen is that AI will also create jobs. I think that's what people are forgetting is that you're going to get, just like when factories started to get automated with robots, the number of jobs will just change. You'll get a lot more opportunities as well. So which industries are going to be affected by sort of this mass exodus of, of jobs? It's, it's really hard to say because for most industries, say, for example, banking, um, fraud detection, if you get, great, get a great algorithm for that, is that going to do anything? Not really. Um, if someone created a great stock market prediction algorithm that was amazing, then maybe some of the people who are brokers will have to start you know, doing a lot better or more likely what they'll do is they'll probably just combine the efforts. They'll get their own AI and they'll be better at it. If you're entry level, I, I wouldn't panic yet. If you're interest, if you're going to start learning programming right now, I think I would start off in the ML space. Um, but, or just be aware of it. Just, just make sure you know, because what will happen is companies are gearing are becoming the type of um, individuals who want to pick up people who know more things rather than one specific thing. So I think specificity will go out the window. So for example, for me, I was a mobile developer and companies would always ask, okay, can you do DevOps? Can you do X? Can you do Y as well? So I think that's going to go away. Specialists will become less um, prominent and generalists will become a lot more uh, wanted and desired. Thanks. So Fahim, we actually have two related questions. I'm going to combine them. Um, okay. on ethics and legislation. Uh, so what steps are being taken currently to overcome the ethical issues? And then a similar additional question is, do you think legislators are doing enough to tackle the ethics, uh, ethical issues that you have mentioned? And what more do you think they can or should do? Okay, so this is something I have a bit of experience with. So. I think the, the gold star uh, for legislation would be Europe and they have their GPDR. They're doing an amazing job. They have very intelligent people who've worked in sort of data science and understand the kind of things that people are doing. Um, what's being done, so if I look at Asia, there are definitely some rules, but they aren't very clear. So if I look at the PII information stuff and if you look at that legal document in Malaysia, it doesn't tell you what kinds of data you're allowed to unencrypt and put in the cloud, number one. It's vague. So either that's intentional uh, to give people a way out or for legislation to be able to crack down how they want, I'm unsure. Um, what more can be done is a lot more auditing, a lot more heavy fines and a lot more scaring. If you do break them, you know, don't let them get away with it kind of type, type of thing. You can, you can use GPDR as a tactic and breaking up large companies. I think Google is having a very hard time there. So that's one. Um, I think there's another question. What was the other part of that question? What more legislators can do? Yeah, crack down and be a lot more firm in, in what's, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So in a scenario, I don't think, but honestly, I don't think it could be a legislation thing. I think it's two pronged. Number one, it has to be consumers themselves have to be a lot more aggressive on saying, I don't want to be spied on. Number one, I don't care if I get a benefit out of it. Supposedly, I want these regulations in place. So that's one, you know, you, you decide with your wallet. The other thing is it has to be middle management and upper management putting their foot down and saying um, the ROI is not as important. Because most of these offenses will be from scenarios where a manager who is the head of data science, who's looking at location data, is going to start using that location data to see, uh, are my employees going on interviews or are they really going on medical leave? 
these are examples that have happened I've seen in the industry or they're spying on their wives or they're using call data or, or their spouses or they're using call data to figure out if their manager secretly has illicit affairs and blackmailing them. So these kind of things will happen constantly and you hear about it all the time and it's all hushed tones that no one wants to talk about. So maybe whistleblower protection is something that legislation can do. Yeah, this, the, the ethics questions actually seem to be quite, um, quite important. Um, so the last question I ask and related to this one. So let's move away from private businesses to government. Mm -hmm. And this question is, so does this imply that fewer people will have more power in making bigger decisions governing the masses? Would you agree with this? And if so, how, how, would, you, how would we avoid it? Hmm. Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Well, fewer people have more power in making, uh, I think without being too negative, I think that's already the case now. I think that's usually how economies work. It's very top down, um, that pyramid. I think what'll happen is one thing that we start seeing is people will no longer trust data. I think that's very, you know, once people realize there's so many bots and out there and tomorrow I say, Hey, you know, I did an analysis on Twitter and X, Y, Z. People will be like, yeah, don't, you can't trust it because there's bots, there's people doing misinformation. So maybe there will become a bit of an issue where people want to rely on data, at least from a government, political, social things, and you'll start getting problems like that. The other big problem is less, it's less intentional. It's imagine you're, an, you know, you're an, a budding data scientist, you work for a news company, okay? You wanna sell newspapers and blog articles and you create a recommendation engine. And the recommendation engine's goal is to give people something they like more. So imagine I really was into alternative medicine. So it'll always give me positive articles about alternative medicine. And maybe I won't get that newfangled uh, cancer treatment because I don't believe in it because all the articles have only told me positive things about alternative medicine and negative things about traditional medicine or Western medicine. And it wasn't my intention as a budding data scientist to do that. I just wanted my company to do well. And now you've created a problem for individuals. So I feel that is becoming more of an issue. Sort of this engineers and middle management and upper management looking at either the bottom line or the science and thinking, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this rather than should we even do it in the first place? Excellent. I, I'm going to, I just so one. Okay, this is really the last question now. Can, okay. we, can, can you put us a positive spin on it? All of us as individuals, what should we be the most excited about from an AI perspective? I think the most exciting thing is, other than the technology, but I think it has great implement, uh, implications to do positive social change. I think, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that, I'll, I'll give an example in healthcare. One of the big problems in healthcare, I don't know if it is globally, but I know it is from the US point of view, is that doctors are overworked. They're worked 24 hours and there's a specific reason or 24, 48 hours nonstop. And that's specifically for continuous care. You have to do that. And that's been proven that if you switch doctors in the middle of the care, it'll become a problem and the patient will die. If you start having a lot of this AI and machine learning in, they can get a mental load off. They can make less mistakes, less problems, less poor decisions and get better results. And that's across the field, whether it's in an aging population, you can have robots that take care of the elderly, whether it, it could even be as simple as like therapy, you can get great AI robots that help people through mental issues and, you know, therapeutic issues. Sometimes people don't want to talk to a real person because they're ashamed of their problems. And now you can just talk to an AI and do it. The other thing you see is, um, you know, third world countries, you can put some of these inexpensive AI products at the edge and bolster their economies really quickly. You can give people an education way better than they would have in the past and with pen for pennies on the dollar. So there's definitely a lot of good here to be done as well. But I think I want to, I'm, I'm sorry for being a little bit negative, but I think it was important because I think most of what we see in professional industry, not necessarily in the news, but when you're in, in the work of AI, it's always shown as this uh, magic wand that cures everything and it's beautiful and it's gorgeous and it's amazing. And, and really it's just like anything else. It's more of a double-edged sword and it has a lot of downsides as well. 
just has to be managed like anything else. Exactly. Like yeah. Fahim, thank you very, very, very much. I know how hard you worked um, on this presentation and, you know, really appreciate, um, you know, really raising our awareness um, and educating us uh, on what AI and machine learning is. And uh, again, from uh, IPN, on behalf of IPN, or on behalf of the education portfolio, uh, and on behalf of the Jamaat, thank you very much for, for your presentation today. You're welcome, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.